uh, of basic principles of uh, quality management and she is going to continue uh, with this topic today uh, with a more critical approach and seeing how these principles that she discussed in her last presentation can be applied in other settings and in different sectors. Uh, she, I will remind you that she also has another talk coming up tomorrow, again, on applications of quality management in education. So if you are interested, please make sure to attend. Uh, so we, are, we have one more attendant, so let's just wait a little bit. I am sure other attendants will be joining in. Uh, Dr. Rabah, it's a pleasure to have you again with us. So please, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Robert, and thank you, Open University of Cyprus, for having me during this week to give you some lectures about total equality management. It's a great pleasure and honor of mine. Uh, I can see that some of the participants for today's uh, of today's lecture have already participated or attended the first uh, lecture. Uh, Stavros, uh, hello, you're, you've attended uh, the first lecture and also the second that we had at hybrid on campus in the university. Welcome again. Um, some people haven't, uh, it's the first time I can see them. Also, uh, Aristides, also, I'm happy to see you again today. Uh, I'm gonna, some names are new to me. That's why I'm going to just give you a brief introduction about myself, just to break the ice where we get to know each other's more and to be able to have this session as a discussion session, especially that it uh, looks at total equality management from a critical perspective today. Um, okay. So for me, I'm basically a doctor in education specialized in quality management in higher education. Uh, I have a doctorate in education from Birmingham University, Dubai branch. And my research area is in pedagogical research, quality management, higher education leadership, and I'm also interested in research methods uh, qualitative versus quantitative research methods and paradox theory and model building. I'm a reviewer and ed, uh, for different some journals, but for Sage, I'm a reviewer and editor as well. Uh, I have some administrative as well as academic experience in the university and the registrar and faculty coordination. And currently, I'm the dean of quality at the Modern University of Business and Science after spending about 14 years at the American University of Dubai and the University of Fulham in Dubai and the UAE. The Modern University for Business and Science uh, is a multi-campus university. It has six campuses and it's uh, what's special about it is that uh, it uh, is so active in terms of internationalization. We always look for collaboration and affiliations with universities worldwide in order to bring some cross-cultural awareness and interaction between students from different areas of the world under globalization. We're affiliated with the Stanford University USA, Cardiff Metropolitan, University of Staffordshire, and uh, Princeton University currently. We are accredited by a European accreditation, a VALAG accreditation, and we're also number one in Lebanon on uh, an impact ranking, THE impact ranking award in terms of quality education, SDG4, and gender equality, SDG5. And we're number 51, we're 51st worldwide as a rank. Uh, we are so interested in community service. We provide a lot of services to our community and we conduct research that helps the community and provides us uh, with uh, a data to be able to prove ourselves among researchers worldwide and in top journals. Okay, 
Today, we're going to discuss some successful cases of TQM versus some failing cases. And we're going to uh, have a look why some organizations that apply total quality management, although it's a very recommended model in organizations, uh, have failed and what was the reason, what should be done, how can we apply total quality management in our organizations and make it a success. Uh, and we're going to discuss some debatable concepts in TQM. But before we start talking about TQM and after I've introduced myself to you, I'd really love if we can, if I can know you better, where you can introduce yourselves to me by telling me your full name because, uh, uh, so we can know you because some names are written in Greek and I apologize, I don't understand the Greek, and your job or your career field so we can have a, a, a productive discussion uh, where we can talk about quality management in your areas as much as possible. Uh, so I know Stavros, but would you please, if you can uh, introduce yourself to, to those who are with us? I know you may know, know each others, but it's good to remind us with your background, please. Okay, whenever you're ready, Stavros, you, please feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, also, if your microphone does, does not work, feel free to add your information in the chat. Yes, please. And you could also do it in Greek and we can translate, so do not be shy. Yeah, please feel free. Uh, Aristides, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Aristides. I am a mechanical engineer and I'm working as a quality assurance and control specialist in aluminum extrusion uh, factory. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you for the third time attending my lecture. I see this. It's my pleasure. Uh, Eleni, would you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Um, I am Eleni from Athens, Greece, and uh, I am a student uh, at the Open University of Cyprus at this. Um, at the area of technology and quality, uh, this course. Mm -hmm. um, I have been working um, in the IT uh, area, information mm -hmm. technology area for many years uh, in the banking sector. But mm -hmm. uh, lately I have moved to a different area uh, that is more in the quality assurance uh, um function it's let's say oh, so uh, this was the triggering that made me attend this uh, course and um, dive into more uh, uh, profound uh, areas around the technology you. and all that Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Definitely, the, this MBA would help with this master's degree in addition to attending these lectures. And we'll talk today as well, how can we uh, help ourselves in terms of research in order to learn more about the area that you are interested in or the area that would actually help us in our career. So this is the first time you attend the this session with me, you, you didn't attend uh, Tuesday's session, last Tuesday's session. Um, unfortunately, I could not make it. So yeah. uh, if it is possible yeah. to uh, watch later some uh, recording, it would be very nice. But I don't know if it was uh, recorded uh, also Tuesday's uh, session. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, this gives me an opportunity to remind everyone that if you want to either see again, watch again the presentations that were given on Monday, um, you can 
go to the same room where we are right now, there is a list of recordings uh, and all the sessions are being recorded. So you can go back and watch them again, or if you miss them, uh, like Eleni did, you can go back and watch them for the first time. So definitely. Okay. Okay. We need that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. You are most welcome. Okay, uh, Mika Mikael, I think you've attended Tuesday's uh, session, but maybe your microphone wasn't working. Also, last Tuesday, we didn't get the chance to know you more. But in all cases, welcome to the class. Feel free to talk to us or to send us message in the chat, even in Greek. Uh, Dr. Robert will help us to translate. Uh, and who else? We have Stavros as well. Two more people. Would you please help me with the names? Uh, Elizabeth. We have Elizabeth and Constantina. Okay. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, please. Uh, and uh, would you please introduce yourself and Constantina as well? I see Constantine is having problems with her, her connection because I guess yeah. Uh, yeah, the her connection is not very stable. So again, yeah. let me just remind everyone, uh, we just do this brief warm up exercise to see the backgrounds and that helps Professor Haba to make a more targeted talk so that she can address with specific examples uh, how quality management models uh, can be applied in your area of work. So if you cannot open, if you don't have a working microphone or feel shy, just feel free to drop us a message in the chat and Professor Rabat will read it. And if it's in Greek, if you prefer to write in Greek, I gladly can translate for her also in the chat. Uh, so drop your information in the chat and I guess then Professor, we can just continue with the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Robert. Also, I'd like to welcome you, Erato, to the session. And you can also uh, uh, contribute to the discussion, especially that you come from the uh, administrative, higher education administrative background within your experience at the Open University of Cyprus. Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure again. Uh, so what we're going to have right now is a discussion about total quality management. And please feel free to uh, to talk. Don't be shy. Nothing is right and nothing is wrong, in fact, when it comes to debate. Uh, there are no wrong ideas. There are opinions. And you can always share with us your opinion. And you can always discuss it. Now, OK, we've already talked about some of these slides last Tuesday's session. And we have some people here that, who were not with us. You can watch the recorded session, of course. I'm not going to go through details, but I'm going to go through like a quick brief about total quality management. So when we reach the debate and the discussion uh, part, you'll be able to uh, interact with us more and you'll be able to remember what is quality management in general about. Uh, what we've done last Tuesday is we talked about quality management. We, I'm just recapping also for those who attended on Tuesday, this wouldn't be bad, so we can get back to uh, where we've uh, finished last Tuesday. So what we did is we talked about quality management. We said that the concept of quality is very old and it started long time back in China in the ancient China Zhu dynasty, like in the 11th century when they were looking for quality of handicraft. But in the modern age, it was more of quality control when they started looking for defects in manufacturing companies and removing these defects. So after production, they search for defects or things that were done in a wrong manner, and they remove them or take corrective action. Then they thought that they need to improve the quality better and to reduce the defects. So the concept of quality assurance started, 
and it was based on avoiding mistakes before they happen. But when we say avoiding mistakes, the problem was that the management was a bit tough with the staff and employee or employees because they were managing them in a way that they are not allowed to do mistakes and mistakes is like a bit forbidden or defects. This created the idea of total equality management that say the management system, the way you manage people who are producing products in manufacturing will lead to products without defects. So if you want to have a good production line, if you want to have a good result with products that have no defects, you have to start from the very beginning with dealing with people or employees in a proper manner and in a way that it motivates them, it empowers them, it creates satisfaction among them, they have the team spirit. Total equality management focused a lot on employees, on people. These were the asset or, or these are the asset and the most important resource for the organization that quality management scholars always argue that Employees or people are the most important resource or competitive advantage that competitors can't compete with uh, such organizations. If they have very high quality uh, IT system, if uh, your competitor has a very high quality IT system, a software, or if uh, uh, they have a very uh, a good uh, uh, resources in terms of physical resources, you can always get what your competitors have and even get much better than that. Uh, but it cannot necessarily happen in, uh, uh, in human resources, like when you cannot compete with human resources. If your competitor have more loyal and expert people, uh, this is the big problem to get same like these people and or to train your people to become as uh, as loyal and as expert as your competitors are. So the total quality management focused, as we said on uh, last Tuesday, on seven main points that you should always remember. Customers, customers should always be happy. And when we say customers and total quality management, always remember that customers are internal customer and external. External are the customers who uh, buy the product or the service, and internal are the employees or the people of the organization. Leadership styles, teamwork, where people all work together as a team, empowerment, and not only delegation, because in delegation you uh, you tell people what to do and you tell them how to do, you delegate the task, uh, but you don't give a lot of authority and decision making like empowerment. The corporate culture, a clear strategy with its objectives and continuous improvement. And you know that, or most of you know that Deming is the founder of Total Equality Management that uh, he focused on continuous improvement mainly through plan, do, check, act, cycle. Um, you plan, you have a strategy, you plan it, you, uh, you implement, you check, and then you take corrective action in case there is a problem. And he created his 14 points of quality as well based on, uh, based on his main profound theory of knowledge focusing on the seven points that we've mentioned. Uh, other gurus we talked about were our Jurin, who also have the cycle of quality planning, quality control and improvement based on Deming's cycle because Deming started it and he's the founder. And uh, we have also five uh, main scholars that as quality management students or scholars, let's say, because at MBA level, you should start thinking of conducting research and publishing in the area that would add value to your career. Uh, you should always remember these uh, seven names, Deming, Jiren, also Crosby, who believes in zero defects, doing it right first time. Masaki Emai, who believes in continuous improvement in the workplace. 
Feigenbaum, who developed the total equality management concept and who believes that the quality quality is everybody's job. Teguchi, in terms of inspection and statistics, he's the, he's a very uh, expert scholar here. And Ishikawa, and with his fishbone diagram that helps us to solve problems whenever we face problems. Okay, all of this, as we said last Tuesday, started in manufacturing and you gradually moved to the service industry in public and private organizations. And uh, uh, then to pub yeah, first uh, service, then public organizations, in fact, including healthcare and education that we talked about yesterday. Uh, and first it started in Japan, moved to the States, and then gradually to less or developed or developing countries. Okay. We also talked about the awards of quality management, and we said that these awards are based on quality management concepts, like the EFQM, which is uh, a European award. It's based on the seven uh, principles of uh, TQM. Uh, Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award, it's an American award. If you're planning to open your organization in the States, uh, it's a very important award that adds value uh, to, to, to your reputation. Australian Quality Award in Australia, Dubai Quality Award, ISO, and Six Sigma. Okay. I'm going to share some successful cases here with you about total equality management. Uh, but first of all, we've, we've been talking for the last five to 10 minutes about quality management. I've been talking, in fact, not you. And its importance, its advantages, these seven principles, uh, the value that these seven principles actually add to the management in any organization. While I was talking, please be honest and let's start our discussion. While I was talking about quality management, did you think that you don't agree on, in any of the points? And you can be honest, because even if you've read my research, I don't agree in a lot of points. And in higher education, which is my area of research and my area of expertise, the quality management model that I created for universities, which was the topic of my thesis, it was really modified to fit the higher education context. Total quality management can be applied on different industries, different organizations, whether in the public or private and whether in industry or in service, let's say. But I am a person who believes it sh should be modified to fit to the context that uh, it works in or it's applied in. So it's normal that you would feel, for example, let's say, Ellen, you would feel that, okay, that, uh, that would work, but let's say empowerment is not something very successful and applicable to uh, to to ban to the banking sector, what do you think, Eleni? Eleni, right? Uh, is is it is it applicable to to, all, to to your sector? It's good to have discussion based on the sector that you work in. These well, points that I I think that um, as you already mentioned, uh, the people are the most important factor in the success. Uh, in this journey of total quality. So this must be uh, always in the mind of the managers uh, that the people is the most important resource and uh, they have to engage everyone in order to have success. Um, so whatever the area, whatever the... Um, um, uh, the, 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 the yeah. sector, I mean, yes, exactly, the sector yes. that um, a, the enterprise is uh, 
I are applying to. Um, people are always uh, there, the, the first um, factor that we must address. And I think it is also the most difficult in order to give motives, motivation, yes. to give uh, uh, reward, uh, etc. Because you may uh, think a lot of different ways to address let's say procedures, um, uh, machinery, um, equipment in general, but uh, people are not predictable and are more difficult to handle and uh, engage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, what you're talking about, Eleni, is very important because most of the cases that study TQM in organizations, they end up saying that either the success was because people accepted it and they were trained enough and they were ready to change their culture into more of a total equality management culture, or you would find that uh, it didn't work, there were failing cases, and the reason was also due to people, uh, either weakness or unacceptance, unacceptance of change. So yes, they are the most important, and whenever you want to apply any management system, if they don't accept it, it wouldn't be successful, because as you've said, these are the most important assets that whatever the business is doing, uh, whatever success it is getting, if the people are not the right people, it wouldn't be that successful. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And this applies for the banking sector, of course. Okay. Now, for the public sector, uh, TQM was in UK, a very good example is at the Majesty's Custom and ex uh, Excise and the Benefits Agency. They applied total equality management system and they found a lot of success, especially in terms of reducing waiting and answering call times. In, in a regional office of the US Environmental Protection Agency, Clerical and managerial employees were most favorable to TQM because professionals were, uh, uh, people, uh, employees, were, they thought that TQM is successful, but for the professionals, they consider it more of a negative impact uh, on them because they found that it had little direct rewards and more work from the implementation of the TQM process. And by the way, if, as I can see here that you are studying this master's degree that ha has a big part uh, about quality management, and many of you are already working in the quality management area, like LNE, uh, uh, like uh, also, uh, uh, Aristides, you are in quality assurance. So, yeah, be careful about this point and learn from previous experiences that one of the problems that face TQM when you apply it and you would get rejection or they would tell you that it's not working is that if you don't work on the reword, the reward is something so important to show people as uh, they move gradually to total quality management, they, they're getting benefits from it. Because it, total quality management has more of a long-term reward, uh, reward, uh, reward, like in order to train people to have teamwork and train managers for better leadership skills, and this will uh, change the corporate culture with time. We'll have a strategy with the clear goals and objectives and it will take time to get it implemented. Uh, the satisfaction of the uh, customers, the satisfaction of the employees based on the leadership styles of the managers. All of this, if you think about it, when you want to apply it, it takes time. 
That's why most of the organizations that started the quality management, they would say, okay, it is successful, but it's taking a lot of work, a lot of documentation, a lot of writing that uh, it's not worth, and they would quit. Okay, that's why the best way to avoid this problem, learning from other previous cases, is try to give rewards and in incentives and recognitions and celebrations gradually. Even it's a small success, like reducing waiting and answering call times, if you consider it small, it depends on the main uh, purpose of the organization, then uh, uh, do these rewards or give rewards to the employees and the team, small rewards, so they feel that they are going, going uh, on a successful track, they are improving what they're supposed to do, and they, uh, they will keep supporting the quality management system. Because as quality experts, this is the most uh, popular um, problem that we face. We get uh, the idea, we get, to, uh, get it rejected. Uh, in early stages, before we are able to prove that it is successful. Okay. I'm going to share with you now the top five famous quality management failures in the world. And we're also going to learn uh, how to avoid uh, quality management failures in the organizations that we work in or we're planning to apply quality management, whether in our research or, or in practice, if, if you are in the quality management area. Okay. Uh, Three Mile Island, in fact, this is a uh, and when I'm saying here quality management failure, it's, it's not total quality management, because don't forget that we talked about quality control, quality assurance, and then total quality management. These are the three main uh, quality management systems, but there are also different and customized quality management systems to different organizations, okay? So, this is a case about the nuclear power in the late in the late 70s. There are some old cases and some very new cases, but these are considered the top famous quality management failures. What happened in March 1979, there was the worst nuclear disaster in the US. Uh, at the island, the Three Mile Island, uh, the facility in Eastern Pennsylvania uh, had a, a very uh, bad experience and problem. Maybe you, you've read about this before. In fact, proper controls that should have been developed as part of routine safety procedures were not in place. Okay, we're talking here about quality control and also quality assurance to check safety. The auxiliary coolant system valves were shut for maintenance. So they shut the coolant systems uh, valves for maintenance, but the reactor was operating. So a failure in the main coolant system resulted in no coolant, of course, and the situation was uh, exacerbated by human error, eventually attributed to the lack of proper training. So a human error had led to the uh, uh, worst nuclear disaster, in fact, and that explosion. And the only nuclear power station built since that day were the, uh, the ones already under construction. So. It was a very bad experience, and after investigation, they found that the coolant system uh, wasn't working because it was, by human, uh, by human error, closed for maintenance. So this is an example of quality management that led to a great failure. 
The second is the Hubble telescope. Imagine with this great technology, uh, the images were only slightly better than Earth-based telescopes and very distant and faint objects. And the reason was uh, because the mirror wasn't actually placed appropriately or uh, done in a proper way. So uh, a congressional investigation revealed that during production, negative testing, okay? So you see here, it's also part of quality, results from multiple, uh, different testing results from multiple instruments were ignored, while the good readings from a flowed instrument were accepted. Uh, additional billions were spent correcting the problem. Then they had to change the mirror and correct the problem. Again, inspection problem. iPhone 4, maybe some of you have tried iPhone 4. And if you remember, uh, with iPhone 4, calls were dropped suddenly and frequently causing widespread uh, dissatisfaction with loyal customers who upgraded to the new version early on while Apple continued to deny or minimize the problem. And this is a bad customer uh, satisfaction uh, point. Independent tests revealed that touching the left side of the case at a certain spot interrupted the signal and dropped the call. So there was a defect. Not a great feature for a handheld device, of course, used primarily to make call. As the issue continually made the new cycle, Apple eventually conducted a voluntary recall to correct the problem. But after customers have tried and experienced the problem. The fourth famous quality management failure is just a few months after being completed in early June of 1976, please, if you have not, write them down and then we will discuss. The earthen uh, dam in Idaho collapsed and completely flooded about six miles of the Teton River Canyon to devastating results. And you can't believe what was the reason. Not only improper material used in the construction, but the main outlet and spillway gates needed to relieve a pressure were closed and blocked. And why? With sheet metal for painting. This maintenance was being done in the spring, even though it was not unexpected that during this time of the year, the reservoir created by the dam would fill to capacity. And it did. So for some painting maintenance, this had led to a disaster. Ford Pinto, maybe the guys here would uh, have uh, information about it. And it's most well known and the worst disaster that in the uh, uh, automobile industry. Apparently, the entire U.S. auto industry decided to spend the 1970s resting on their laurels of building great cars that people wanted during the 60s. Not only were many cars built during the 70s ugly, but also unreliable after 40 or 50,000 miles. Its design flaws and questionable ethical decisions by top management made it dangerous as well. Okay, so what is happening here? Why, why are we having disasters in here? And if you think about them, these five disasters are mainly due to failure in the quality management system, whatever this system is, whether it's quality control in terms of inspection for the problem, or quality assurance in terms of making sure that the products are produced appropriately and that the process is going the right way, like in the case of the uh, nuclear explosion. Uh, so how would 
what would you tell about this? How would such organizations have avoided these problems? Where is the lack? Where is the problem? Where is the gap, in fact? What do you think? Let me ask you the question in a simpler way. Could these companies avoid the disasters that they faced? Were they able to avoid these disasters? What do you think? Okay, in fact, they would have avoided them and according to research by using the total equality management triangle. And when we say the total quality management triangle here is by focusing on three angles, customers, uh, process, and people. So not only the process, also people, because in some cases that we've read, there was a problem in uh, training the people. In other cases, there was a problem in the process of checking and controlling and maintenance. In other problem, there was a problem of for customer satisfaction and dealing ethically with them. So all the above quality management failures could probably uh, have been prevented if all the, uh, the quality management principles, the seven principles that I've mentioned at the beginning, were actually there. So the most important lesson we're learning here from successful versus uh, failing cases, especially the uh, experience of qu uh, quality management failure cases, is that when you want to apply total quality management, you have to apply all the seven principles, or in other words, the quality triangle. But the seven principles will tell you more details about this quality triangle. And if you want further uh, details, you have to go to the 14 points of Deming. And uh, because these 14 points tell you exactly what to do in your organization to apply quality management especially for those who are working in quality management. Okay. These are some debatable concepts in quality management that I'd like to discuss with you today. And please feel free to share your opinion. Even you feel you don't have enough information about each point or you need to read more, but let's see what would your uh, first opinion be before reading and investigating about uh, the topic. Most of you work in companies, whether you are in management positions or not. And I, I am sure that most of these companies have like, um, appraisal system or evaluation system. Would you please share with us, and, and this is a very important point in total quality management that talks about performance appraisal. And when we want to talk about appraisal, we shouldn't forget that it's part of employees. Satisfaction, key performance indicators, MBOs that we talked about last Tuesday, so my question is to you, how should employees evaluations or appraisals take place? Please share with us, how is the appraisal happening in your uh, organization? Uh, for example, in the in, uh, aluminum industry, Aristides, uh, as a mechanical engineer, do they look at your performance or do you look at the, at the performance of people who may report to you? How uh, is the evaluation done, the evaluation of staff? Although in TQM, they like to name it as appraisals more than evaluation to show that we are appreciating the work of the employees more than uh, investigating or inspecting the quality of their work. 
So my question for you Aristides, if you can answer please, is how is the performance appraisal happening in, the, in your industry, in your area? Uh, so uh, we don't have this kind of uh, appraisal for quality because they don't look so much about uh, people's um, quality, for example. They only appreciate the, the, um, the value of uh, our products in the end of the year, for example, and they give us some bonuses uh, in the end of the year. Only this, nothing else. Okay. Okay. So the bonus is based on the production more than like performance yes. On, yes. on an individual base. Okay. Interesting. Uh, uh, what we do in the university, and this is in different universities, and the same happens in MUBS, is that it's more of a service that we are providing. And uh, there's uh, two types of appraisal. We have administrative staff appraisal and academic staff appraisal. The administrative staff appraisal happens annually, once a year, by the direct manager. And the directors do the appraisal for the managers and the vice presidents conduct the appraisal for the directors and then the president conducts the appraisal for the vice presidents where uh, the, the appraisal is, is done at all levels. And for the administrative staff, as I told you last Tuesday, we, uh, we have MBOs, we have objectives, because we are preparing for implementing total quality management, we're gradually implementing it. So staff decide with their manager what are like five main objectives they want to achieve during the year. And at the end of the year, they meet with the manager and they talk about these five objectives. If they were not achieved, they tell him or her what the university can help them to achieve it. And I'm talking here about administrative staff like registrar staff, student affairs, admissions, uh, uh, bursar's office staff, IT staff, and the appraisal, um, and the manager decides on the appraisal, and the employee would ask for some trainings, and the manager would suggest other trainings for the sake of uh, development. And salary increase uh, happens annually based on this appraisal. Uh, for academic staff, it happens also once a year for full-time academic staff, but the appraisal is different. It's from the dean, and you were talking about professors. So their appraisal is based on their teaching style through course instructor evaluation that we conduct with the students. So they give the feedback about the teaching styles. Uh, second, uh, the research conducted during the year. And third, administrative service provided to the university, like academic advising and being members in committees. For the part-timers, it's only done based on teaching, uh, course instructor evaluation. They don't have research and administrative tasks uh, uh, responsibility. So this is in the university. This is an example. And it mostly applies to all other universities. Anyone else would like to share how is appraisal done in their organizations? And here we're talking about employees. Sometimes it's linked to the target. Some people would say that they have a target they want to achieve. If they achieve it, then their uh, performance is considered done properly. If not, they, it's not. Uh, similar to what Aristides is sharing with us. Uh, although in quality management, they would say that don't evaluate people based on the results. They may uh, look at their performance and in order to help them improve because maybe they can get better results if you work on their uh, performance improvement, like providing more trainings, more uh, self-development, more, more uh, career development. Okay. Uh, 
Um, any of your organizations have MBOs, management by objectives, where staff should write a list of objectives and they need to achieve every year or every six months? Okay. Uh, may I uh, add something here uh, in the conversation? Uh, this is a lady. Uh, I would like to know how we can have some feedback from the clients into this uh, discussion, to this praise. I mean, okay, let's suppose that we manage to uh, get our objectives uh, all right, um, all the numbers are fine, but the, we have some complaints or uh, some uh, uh, other um, uh, feedback from the customers that the service may be typically correct, but the, um, the way that uh, people treat the customers is not so polite, it's not so... Um, in time or uh, there are delays there are other issues uh, and these all must be taken into account because it's not only about numbers uh, it, there is a more uh, uh, qualitative uh, uh, flavor in all that uh, yes collecting feedback from customers or clients is really important Total quality management insists on collecting this feedback and insists in, on collecting it from external clients or customers and also internal who are employees because to the total quality management, internal customer satisfaction leads to external customer satisfaction. That's why they name them customer uh, customers for the employees because they say customers are always right according to total quality management. And some of you may agree, some of you may not, but according to total quality management, customers are always right. Uh, so they put uh, employees under the category of customers to be satisfied. Now your question about how we can collect feedback from clients, my answer to you would be depending on the industry. For example, I'll give you examples. In restaurants, sometimes uh, when you finish your meal, they bring you the tablet where you, they ask you for your feedback or a, a piece of paper, or they leave it even in hospitals to put your feedback and they keep it optional and anonymous. They don't ask for your name. Uh, some other companies, they have feedback system on the website where you can go and leave a feedback, whether it's a positive or negative. Like in the university, I can give you an example from my area and you can share with us about your area in banking and for other colleagues in their areas. Uh, and for us, we collect feedback from students through course instructor evaluation. We post it on the man, uh, university management system for each and every course to give their feedback about the professor's teaching style and the course itself. We collect uh, feedback through student satisfaction surveys that happens once a year, and it's related to administrative services and facilities in the university. That one is related to the academic. And on the website, we have some a third thing where you can leave your uh, feedback, whether it is uh, a suggestion for improvement, a complaint, or even something that you want to uh, complement. Uh, these are the three areas. For staff, we conduct a staff uh, satisfaction survey for administrative staff and faculty satisfaction survey once a year. In addition, we have something called quality assurance monitoring uh, process where staff can send a form to the quality assurance department. We have a template, they fill it in, suggesting areas of improvement and or, or problems that they are facing. And also they can suggest how these problems can be solved based on empowerment and ownership, which is a total quality management principle to make sure that they are really 
their voice is being heard and sometimes they know how the problem should be solved. What about the banking sector? How do you collect feedback, Eleni, from your uh, clients? Uh, well, um, in our case, it's quite a uh, um, special case. Uh, so we do not have so many external customers. Uh, it's more providing service to internal customers. And um, there, the appraisal happens in a top-down uh, way. Uh, mm -hmm. So the upper and medium uh, management uh, makes the evaluation for the uh, for the employees that are uh, under their control, let's say, in a direct way. Uh, the feedback from the internal customers is uh, collected in an informal way. It's not uh, very systematic and mm. organized. It's more uh, a kind of uh, um, like in that, that is made. collected in a random way, let's say. Okay. Of okay. course, it has to do with uh, completing some uh, uh, tasks and uh, getting things ready on time and uh, uh, managing to be uh, uh, correct and uh, be uh, precise on the results that uh, you present. But mm -hmm. uh, there is no uh, very typical and uh, systematic way of for collecting external uh, input from clients, whatever yeah. okay. this would mean. Uh, and the most important thing, according to quality management, since you're, you're now involved in quality assurance uh, in banking sector, is to collect feedback, Eleni. Uh, the way you collect feedback is uh, it depends on the industry, it depends on the context that you are working in. That's why I gave you an example of what's happening in the university uh, and in most of the universities, not only our university, of course. In addition to that, uh, here is your creativity to find the best way of collecting feedback. Of course, after benchmarking with similar organizations, but for sure feed feedback should be collected and should be documented, not only in a casual and a verbal way, in order to find gaps and in order to find improvements and to trace the improvement that's happening all, uh, one year after the other. Okay. Another debatable topic in quality management that may open your eyes to a topic for your research, for your thesis, for your, uh, I don't know, maybe later a PhD topic. Should all employees have specific MBOs? Should it be annual, semi-annual, etc.? So we talked last Tuesday about MBOs, management by objectives. We said that uh, some quality management scholars say every staff should have a list of objectives. This list, he or she should write it, send it to the manager, they sit and meet, and they together decide to finalize these objectives. The objectives would be different, like for example, uh, objectives of increasing number of research if you're an academic staff, objective of increasing customer satisfaction uh, results, let's say if you are in the service industry, uh, maybe some trainings that you want to conduct, maybe uh, objectives in increasing the target, etc. Now, the founder of quality management, Deming, said we shouldn't have MBOs because people should be innovative and creative. You're limiting them with certain objectives. So what do you think? Should all employees have specific MBOs? I'm asking you this question because it's nice to have this critical thinking. It doesn't mean that if the founder of quality management disagrees, then there shouldn't be MBOs. You would tell me, in our context, in our organization, MBOs help 
staff to achieve targets and objectives. So what do you think? In, in our university, uh, we have MBOs because, as I told you before, a staff needs some time to, uh, to get used to being creative and innovative. They're in a preparatory stage for quality management, so it's better to have clear objectives in order to achieve them rather than telling them no objectives for their creativity and innovative innovation because they may not achieve any objectives because they are in a preparatory stage. Yes, uh, and you have a question. Open your mic. Yeah. Okay, um, I would like to just say that sometimes or maybe most of the times the objectives are uh, on the level of a team and not on a personal level. So it's not so easy to itemize. <laughs> Why not? Yes, absolutely. Maybe within your context, within the banking sector, this is what's working for you, like to have objectives for the department. And this is a very important point that you're raising here, Eleni. Maybe having objectives for a department would raise team spirit and teamwork in the organization and their work to achieve one mission that the department may have, which is absolutely fine. So this is what I'm trying to tell you here today, that the main concepts of quality management Sometimes they need to modify it. We need to uh, change a bit in them in order to fit the context. And it's nice to look at them from a critical perspective uh, in order to think of how would it best be applied in the organization or the context you are working in. It's really important if you relate it to your uh, area so you can think of what would best apply for you so this is a very good suggestion here that you can you can discuss and you can write a paper about it uh, Eleni that what if men MBOs are by department and not uh, individual MBOs thank you for your input this is important quality circles Quality circles are a very important concept and they are adopted in quality management uh, system organizations where all stakeholders have the right to be members in committees and they call such committees as quality circles to give their input. The only thing that quality management doesn't recommend to be discussed is things related to salaries, uh, because if employees, and we're talking here mainly about employees and like students in schools as well, uh, if they discuss these points or work on them, uh, they wouldn't be objective. They would be biased about uh, things related to their salaries and to their income. Uh, some would say that there, there is no need for these quality circles because um, maybe people will be given a space to discuss things that they shouldn't question or they shouldn't have decision making. So what we're trying to say here that quality circles allow for consensus decision making. All people can give their input in the organization and some decisions are discussed within quality circles and some decisions are taken. Some quality circles are based on plan, do, check, act, where all the work done at the organization is discussed in uh, quality circles. So are you a person who believes in quality circles or not, who can give us his opinion? What do you think, Stavros? We haven't heard your voice yet. After attending these quality management sessions, Stavros, I think your mic maybe is not working. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Um, but after attending these quality management sessions, uh, what do you think? 
can we can we have quality circles? Are they helpful? Okay. Anyway, I, I'll give you the freedom to talk or not, but it's very important to be uh, cautious when using quality circles because you don't want to end up having debates and discussions that are uh, useless or that turns out to become nagging, more like looking for improvement, honestly. Do documentation and continuous reporting facilitate or hinder quality? A very important debatable topic that you sh should think about it if you're applying quality assurance in your organizations uh, is, shall we document everything? Like now we were talking about customers or clients feedback. Should it be documented or it, or there is no need to document it. What about statistics of results? What about key performance indicators? Should there be indicators and, and key performance indicators? What about, uh, even this takes us to the second question, which is uh, procedures and, and processes. Should be all the, the uh, documented and in details? A very important question here. Eleni, what do you think? Please turn on your mic and talk. Yes. Well, I think that when reports are ready, they can be very useful. But it is very cumbersome to prepare these reports and collect yeah. the data and to do all the, the work. So, yes. yes, it can be very helpful and give uh, added value. But yeah. on the other hand, it is quite time consuming and of mm -hmm. course if we want it to be uh, of a good quality uh, uh, they must be prepared with caution uh, so it's difficult yeah yeah absolutely it is very important it's helpful but it is difficult the main advantage is that when you document you can find gaps I've uh, applied this through the last three years in the university uh, within my department. We, what we did is we documented all the policies. There were a lot of policies that were shared by email. Uh, we documented them and we created a policy for documenting policies and reviewing them so we keep our policies updated at all times. Because based on my experience, what I would like to share with you is that when organizations have a clear strategy with clear goals to be achieved and objectives, and this strategy is cascaded to the strategies of different departments, each and every department should have its own strategy and goals. And this strategy of the department within the whole organization should help in creating the policies because here we have policies, procedures, and processes. Policies are the rules and regulations that you refer back whenever uh, you have a certain point that you're looking at. And policies usually are shared by the public and they're uploaded on the website, according to accreditation bodies, like in universities. And uh, then there are the procedures. Procedures of the, D for example, one of the procedures is when a, uh, a prospective student calls the university interested in a certain program. What's the whole procedure that the staff, admissions the staff pass through? This is something that there is no need to be shared with the public that's why we don't name it a policy we name it a procedure that is included in something called for example admissions handbook for the admissions department and every department has its handbook with a procedure you can even take it further which is the process itself 
the process like when you receive a phone call, what's the first thing you say? What the, the, uh, do you answer when you are asked for a question? If it's yes, if it's no, how you should go through this. And the defenders of documenting even these small processes say that the staff himself or herself should document the process because they do it. And they should always review it because sometimes they can delete Muda or Mori as we talked on Tuesday or useless steps, or they can improve it. When you see the process documented in front of you, you can improve it. If, if it's not documented, you, it's hard to find the gaps. So think about it. You may consider that. And this is not only about quality management. You may consider documenting your processes in whatever area that you are doing through flowcharts. Usually processes have their own way of being documented through flowcharts. Uh, who should document them? Quality management, managers, employees themselves, or employees, managers? OK. There are different opinions here. But for sure, the best way, most of the researchers agree that processes should be documented by employees themselves. They should write the steps of their processes. And uh, because, as I said, they know what they're doing, rather than a quality manager who tells them that this is, should be done. Even policies and procedures, the input of the manager of the department and his or her employees is so important and can be, the policies can be written together, like it's, it's a joint effort uh, where the quality manager can see the big picture and how policies, procedures, and processes add value and uh, continue the whole management system. And the managers of the department themselves, they can see the details uh, within each department that they are the experts in, okay? Uh, a very important point that I'd like to talk about here is change management as well. Uh, when, when you want to apply total quality management in your organization, or you want to suggest it, because sometimes you would, you would write a research paper about your organization as a case of applying total quality management. Uh, and that would, I don't know, maybe help in creating a quality management department in your organization or giving you a position related to quality assurance or quality management. But it's very important to work in parallel along with quality management, work in parallel with change management. Quality management is a new system that the cases that we review always show us that when people resist it, it fails. And usually people resist the change. People don't like change. When a new, let's say, software, when a new uh, just a minute, please. Okay, so uh, what I was saying is that uh, when you want to apply quality management, follow change management. Change management helps employees to accept the change to help you have a successful experience in implementing change. And um, it's very important to follow a change management model, like ADCAR model, for example, that says first you create A for awareness, 
they know that they should apply total quality management. When they know they should apply, they have the desire and then you give them the knowledge and this happens by training. You don't start by training directly and then you give them the ability through practice and then the reinforcement for uh, reinforcing the, the change that has happened. So quality management is so important and it goes in parallel with change management in addition to cross-cultural management because if you want to apply quality management you need to understand your people and uh, understanding the people doesn't mean that if they are from the same culture let's say if they are all from uh, from a, a certain country then they have the same culture according to Trumpenar, even people have different personalities. Some people have internal locus of control, some people external locus of control, like some people take the strength from inside and they can be more individualistic and those uh, who are external locus people of control are more like collectivists, they like to work in teamwork. So you need to know your people in order to give them the right task. Definitely, total quality management is uh, something successful, but it should be done as a whole system, focusing on the seven points that we've mentioned, because based on the cases that I shared with you, the most popular cases worldwide today, the main reason of the failure of TQM was taking one point of it, like inspection, like appraisal, like and applying it, but not focusing on its all angles and working on it as a whole. Okay, thank you. I'm going to leave the last 10 minutes for any questions that you may have or uh, comments that you'd like to share. Yes, Eleni, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I would like to ask about these awards that you mentioned in the first slides. Yeah. Uh, let's suppose that an enterprise has managed to get some ISO certification. Uh, is there any uh, reason why they should also go after these awards, the, the European or some other kind of award, is, is there some added value or um, maybe is it uh, easy to, is it a small step uh, ahead to get these awards or these are completely it is, dependent? It is, yeah, it is not a small step if the organization doesn't follow quality management principles. But if the organization it doesn't necessarily apply the full total quality management as a system, but it should be applying its main seven principle and points. If these principles are applied and if they are there, then the quality awards would be easy to apply for because the quality awards criteria are based on quality management criteria. Uh, in addition, for, for is it important or not? Uh, it is important for showing that the organization uh, has high quality. So it is a competitive advantage for organizations to have quality awards, similar to accreditations, for example, in universities. It depends what quality award they're interested in. Now, uh, it depends if you are looking for such a competitive advantage or if your competitors have such awards, you may seek having similar awards in order to have your own competitive advantage, yes. And uh, who would be authorized to uh, inspect these uh, um, this uh, case, the, the enterprises for these uh, um, compliances, let's say, uh, inside have, the European Union or, I don't know. 
Yeah, the EFQM, European Foundation for Quality okay. Management. Yeah, they have their own inspection body that, uh, who are assessors. They are called assessors who come to your organization. First, they have their own criteria. You can visit their website. And last Tuesday, we talked a bit more about the awards. For EFQM, for example, if you visit their website, they have a, they have a criteria. They will tell you what do you have to do in order to get awarded. Usually what you should do is that you take this criteria and you benchmark with the criteria. For example, they tell you that this is the way you should deal with your customers. You should collect feedback, you should take corrective actions for any areas of improvement, et cetera, et cetera. So you work accordingly, you apply what they request, and then you can apply for the award. This is the best way of getting the award. You prepare yourself to have the system that they require or the, to meet the criteria that they have, and then you apply for the award. They look for leadership styles, they look for customer satisfaction, people satisfaction, uh, processes, uh, key performance indicators. So you should have these there, and then you apply for the award. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You Any other input? Thank you so much. Other questions? Okay. Thank you all. So I think we had a very productive session today, uh, Professor Laba. It was really interesting to see how these principles get applied uh, in specific contexts. And I think it leaves many of us with a lot of food for thought as to the precise details of the application of these principles in our own organizations. I'm even thinking within our own organization at the Open University. Uh, I could relate to several of the dilemmas that you were raising about how to collect information, uh, whether you can err sometimes too much on documenting too much, spending too much time, you, you need to strike a balance on this. So I think maybe Erato and I will have some discussions about this further down. It, it was really interesting and I'm sure our students also benefited and, and it will give them a lot of food for thought. Since I yeah. don't have more questions, uh, I would like to remind everyone that tomorrow we still have another talk. It's not organized by the Quality Management and Technology Program, but it's organized by the other uh, program on educational leadership. The talk by Professor Rabat is online. Uh, it will take place at a different time, however. It will take place at 4 p.m., uh, yeah. 4 to 5.30 p.m., and it will be on the balance between TQM and higher education management systems, yes. including collegiality and professional autonomy. I think it's going to be very interesting for people working in the ed educational sector. So even if you are from the uh, do to poo program, I encourage you to attend uh, if you have the time. Um, I don't know if you would like to uh, add something else, Professor Raba, before we close. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure having this discussion with you all. And I'm always ready whenever you want to have further sessions. I'm always ready to join your sessions as well, Dr. Robert. Yeah, definitely. What we were talking about is that. Uh, we will keep the contact between MOBS and OUC so that we can also, if there are online events, that we can advertise to our student population and our professors and, and vice versa. We, we, we should encourage the collaboration Absolutely. with institutions yes. in the region. It's something we definitely seek. So thank you very yes. much again for you. your you. very interesting talks. Looking forward for tomorrow and Thank you everybody for participating. And as, as I mentioned before, all these uh, interventions, all these presentations are being recorded. You can see them in the, in the page of the Blackboard Collaborate Room. You will see the recording for today and the previous one. Thank you everybody and have a good night. Thank you, good night, bye-bye. Good night, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.